So they say that envy can be a terrible thing, and that's something that I suffer from, especially when it comes to art. I'm particularly envious of people that have got the ability to express the uh, feelings and emotions and observations they, they've got to commit that to, to paper and to be able to share that. Um, well, I'm joined by somebody today that, that can certainly do that. That's, that's Natalie Niblick. So thanks. Welcome to the show, Natalie, and thanks for coming here to share some of your insights with us. Thank you. Um, can I start off by asking you how this all began, how you got started in working with art? Well, uh, I was always interested in art and I always did it as a child, um, like to make things. Um, when I became an adult, the issue was, was uh, what confronts anybody who, is, uh, who wants to make a career out of art, which was um, how do you... How do you do that in a society that looks on artists as wastrels? And how do you make a living? So my journey included going to several art schools that uh, were mostly non-accredited, trying to become a what was called a commercial artist. And uh, eventually, after about nine years falling in love with painting and deciding I didn't want to work for anybody else, and then slowly evolving my own voice, as an artist, and then that was, you know, in the 80s. What point did you start to become a more of a kind of a social commentator through your art? <laughs> it's interesting. Um, when I had a when I had a show recently, I gave a talk, and uh, my sister was there, and I I said I made a comment that I'd only been doing political art for like five years, and she almost started laughing. And she thought that my work had always gone that way, um, but in a much, not, not nearly as overtly. And I guess it's just been uh, more social commentary um, and I guess trying to find my, my place in the universe through whatever symbolism I could come up with. But it, had changed, it has changed a lot since about more like seven years ago. There was a lot of um, local discussion around uh, fossil fuels and coal trains and oil trains and building a, a coal export facility here. And, and um, I decided that I just needed to, what I considered at the time was a lot of navel gazing in my artwork um, and really engage with what was, was truly much more um, frightening and immediate and something that bothered me way more than, than anything else. So I, I always felt like in my artwork, I had to paint what bothered me. So do, do you think you benefit from this? Is it a kind of a process that you're able to kind of process the issues that bother you? Yeah, totally. I mean, I would be probably a real whack job if I did. If I didn't do this, I mean, it keeps me sane. Yeah. Now you mentioned before that uh, when you were working towards becoming a professional artist, uh, to, you know, to, I guess to sell your work, how, how well do these works of art sell? Um, well, right now they actually they are doing quite well, uh, but that's never been the goal. That's never, I'm, I'm not very ambitious that way. Um, that's why I always had a straight job. And, and that was, that's the advice I always gave my students. If you really want to do this, get a straight job and you can support it. And then you can truly, truly do what you think is important, what is really compelling to you. Yeah. And maybe you'll get lucky and it'll sell and you'll get a gallery and career and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, probably it doesn't happen to a lot of people. Mm. Mm. But you know. certainly in the polarized society that we're in at the moment, I, I think to be able to present objective art is a, is a real challenge because yeah. the moment a person sees a, an oil train that's, that's exploded, it, it, it puts them in a, an uncomfortable position because as you say, it's reality, but they immediately assume that there's a right. very strong message yeah. with that. But that has to do, of course, obviously with the paintings, how yeah. I'm doing the paintings. But my my where my true uh, 
bias and anger comes out is in the sculpture. I was going to say, let's, I mean, yeah. moving on from, it, yeah. uh, from your, your, your canvases to Mitch and, Mitch uh, and Kim Young. Kim. I mean, they, they definitely... Uh, yeah, they are very, very... Create a reaction that's yeah. negative. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I get the most positive responses from these. I mean, usually, I mean, because I, I think that they involve a lot of humor in them and most people respond to them with a lot of humor. Uh, and kind of responses that you get to them, because I mean, you know, Mitch is creepy. I mean, Mitch is probably creepy on a good day, but yeah. the, <laughs> but yeah. why these two people in particular? I think they're two of the more reprehensible human beings on the earth, um, but, you know, along with Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> and Rudy? Rudy is just a clown. Yeah. This just seemed to be the perfect way to present him as sort of like a, just a big clown. And uh, Goya? Oh, well, this, this is earlier work, before I was doing political stuff. And Julian Freud, I guess, as well. Uh, Lucian. Lucian yeah. I'm sorry, Lucian Freud, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these are two of the painters that I really, really like a lot. Goya is, he, he did a lot of graphic works called the, um, the Capriccios. And uh, this character in a lot of his, his etchings was a plucked chicken with the man's head on it. Mm -hmm. And there's usually some witches pulling his feathers out or right. about to stick a stake up his butt to stick him over the fire. So do you think he was suffering the same kind of nightmares around dystopia that, that you experience Absolutely. now? Absolutely. I mean, he went through the Napoleonic War in Spain you know, with the, the guerrilla, where the ori original guerrilla war happened. And um, his graphic prints are incredibly horrific. Mm -hmm. And then um, late in life, uh, he was more or less banished, or self-banished to a, to a farmhouse in the countryside and painted the black paintings on his walls. So this is sort of a portrait of his, his his ending, his, his end times. And then Lucian Freud, uh, I always loved his paintings, but he, he, he did figurative paintings and I did figurative paintings for a long time, but I couldn't quite make them relevant to my life. You know, they were just persisted in being academic yeah. and not taken to the level that he, he, he was able to take it just to bring out the mortality of the whatever the center you know. yeah but always I always found his work so disturbing though because it, I mean it was always a reflection of himself in every yeah in, in every study but always in, in, in such a kind of a dark yeah. lens through a dark lens yeah. I guess. so I always wanted to to paint that kind of painting but at the same time I've been I was pulled in other directions. So that's why he ended up being the portable Lucian Freud, where he's like three different directions. So moving on to some of your earlier work, uh, and, and, and it kind of ties in exactly with what you're saying, uh, Cleaning Lady Ascends to Heaven. What, what was your thoughts around that when you, when you put that well, together? Well, I have a lot of paintings. Um, well, I, just, I love the Italian Renaissance and Baroque and, and late Gothic. And the, it's for the religious paintings especially, and then there's something that is, I don't know, some kind of Jungian symbology about ascending to heaven that is so, like, so appealing that you could just, that the world is just so crazy and you could just check out, you can just float up to heaven. Hmm. At the time there was a, a video out that was made by some fundamentalist Christians who uh, were, they made it for everybody who get, has to stay on earth after the rapture to explain to them why they're still there and everybody else just started floating off to heaven. And I just thought that was such an absurd thing. Then I decided to do a series of paintings where people I know and I like get to ascend to heaven. And this happens to be a very good friend of mine who, who cleaned houses at the time. Okay. And history lesson? That has to do with our, our collective responsibility for climate change. Um, I took a, a um, school from the early part of the century, a, a classroom shot, 
and drew it. And then the clouds above it are Mamatus clouds that precede a, a major, major climactic event. Once again, trying to get the, the, the viewer would come to this and try to, try to solve what they think about it. Yeah. So McDonald's. Oh, <laughs> I drove across country. Um, and uh, this was late, like last year. And this is what, right after the California fires last year, not the ones this year. And um, every time we would stop somewhere, there just seemed to be no evidence at all that anybody was aware of the disasters that were happening around us. And, you know, people going into the McDonald's with all their single-use plastic and, you know, everybody just consuming American consumer culture gone mad. And so uh, I was doing these fire paintings, so I decided that I would just include some of those people who have corporate responsibility in my fire paintings and some of the, um, I did a big drawing that had a Walmart underwater and a lot of water, Walmart bar bags floating up. Best case scenario, where would you like your pictures to be seen? In, a public, in, in public spaces. I mean, I try to, um, I do have a gallery where I show stuff and, and I do sell stuff there, but I do make an effort to um, go to public spaces. Is that large canvas now. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of thoughts on that. Well, it's got everything in it. <laughs> you know, it has all the, the, um, the garbage underwater. It has Walmart bags. Um, it's, in a lot of my paintings, I included a little clown doll that uh, seemed to be the, ep ep the epitome of the um, mindless consumer. Um, there is a ambiguous, cloud in the distance. It could be a coal fire plant, or it could be an oil refinery, or it could be an explosion. And this gorgeous sunset that is often the kind of sunsets you see when everything's on fire. Mm -hmm. I, was trying, I was trying once again to get that balance between um, this is really beautiful and this is really horrific. Mm. So I get connected to that, your painting cam uh, Candle? Yeah, same thing. Yeah, and the grid in that, I use the grid when I'm doing um, paintings from photo reference, which most of these are done from photo reference because, you know, it's hard to keep a burning tree still long enough to paint it. Um, in doing all the explosions and stuff, I realized that I had to grid it out Otherwise, I would, it would become flat, then I needed the volume there. And um, at first, it was a subjective element when I was doing these oil train explosions that kind of uh, would relay the message that the people who, who are responsible for these oil train explosions, for them, it's just collateral damage. Mo moving on to, I mean, issues uh, closer to what's at hand at the moment, uh, m maybe coincidentally, but the, uh, the police car canvas. Yeah, I just finished that, yeah. Well, that's obviously, I've been watching a lot of um, uh, George Floyd and Bria and Brianna Taylor related um, protests and people setting things on fire. And um, it, was, it was kind of like, this police car is on fire. What do you think about it? Is this, is this an outcome that is a natural outcome of what our society is being and doing or not? So you're drawing the parallels there between a natural outcome of the way we're destroying the environment and the consequences of that and what right. we're doing socially as well. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you, uh, you get, you're angry and distressed and upset about this stuff. And then I decide, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a painting of this car on fire. But then the craft of it, of, of setting it up, it's a very satisfying 
process for me. I'm beginning a painting and then you can get into it and you put the you know, 30 hour book on tape on and then just mm. zone out. So you are able to kind of separate technique, process and an issue. Yeah, I, ne I never go, I think if I was mad when I was actually painting, I would probably not do a very good job. Hmm. But it's back to this is what keeps me sane. I mean, uh, it may not help anybody else, but it's certainly helping me cope with it. So how, how do you see the future just ending up? What, what are your thoughts on the future? What gives you hope? Uh, I've always had an issue with that hope word. You just deal with it. You live in the moment, you do it. Yeah, and it's, it's I don't have much, uh, I don't expect that we will extricate ourselves from this uh, without it getting extremely messy. Hmm. Well, I, I do have quite a bit of hope, but and what, one of my hopes is that you continue to do what it is that you're doing <laughs> and, and that it, it, it has an effect. Yes. Yeah. And, and creates reaction. That's my intention, yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks so much. You're welcome.